good morning. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Um, we're gathered here this morning to talk about S349, uh, which uh, proposes to send some COVID relief fund money um, out for municipalities. Uh, we have a number of folks to hear from this morning. Um, and what I wanna say here at the outset is that um, this kind of open-ended conversation about how to put together a bill that, that um, tries to get uh, millions of dollars out into our Vermont communities is uh, is a a new experience to do on Zoom. And so I just want to welcome committee members um, to reach out to me if there's other perspectives that you would like to hear from that uh, that are not with us here this morning. Uh, we've, we've got more committee time later this week and we can hear from other folks as well. And likewise to, uh, to any of the folks who are with us from outside of the committee, um, you know, if there's a perspective that you think would be valuable, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, if we were all in the state house, of course, you know, these would be conversations that we might have in the hallway after uh, after we leave committee. So I just want to make sure that folks uh, feel welcome to have those hallway conversations. Um, if you think there's something that we didn't uh, cover when we were here in committee. So thank you for being with us. Um, I think what I would like to do first is invite Karen Horn to, uh, to share with us some information. Um, Karen has been uh, obviously polling um, municipalities from around the state to, uh, to see what their COVID needs are. Um, and as we frame up what we, what the house will do with S349, we know at, at a minimum that we don't have a $16 million box to, to work with. We have a $10 million box to work with. Um, and so Karen, if you could help us understand a little bit more of the range of needs, uh, COVID relief needs that you've heard from municipalities, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, thank you, um, Karen Horn with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. And I did send um, over uh, some preliminary results from our survey uh, that, that was conducted in May, second half of May. And um, Representative Harrison had asked for some of this information. So, uh, what we, what we asked in, in the first instance was what new or additional sources of funding towns are seeking for revenue shortfalls. So that's the first table. Um, I apologize, I'm not the best formatter in the world. So it's, it's kind of um, messy, but we, we're uh, looking for state funds. We're working very hard with the um, National League of Cities and uh, other organizations in Washington, D.C. to see if there might be federal funds made available or if the guidance might be changed to allow for use to um, recover lost revenues um, or replace lost revenues as part of the CARES Act. But um, that's not moving very quickly, you may have noticed. Um, we have a number of towns that are um, borrowing to cover essentially the education payments that they, they had to make. There were 31 towns that reported that they did that. We had um, 100, did I say up here at the top? We had 196, I believe, towns respond, but not every community responded to every question. And if they didn't really know um, what, what their needs were, they tended to say either I don't know or not say anything at all. So um, there's a number of towns that are using reserve funds that, they, that they've had that they can move to cover um, some of these needs. And then um, there's, there's 28 towns that don't anticipate needing additional funds, um, which is interesting, that's good. Uh, I think that um, 
that number might change quite a bit as the year progresses and we get into the new fiscal year and people start making or not making property tax payments um, in July, August and uh, into November and beyond. So that's the first question. Um, we asked what kind of unanticipated expenses and activities towns have had. Um, and then our, our um, uh, IT person or I guess survey person, Heather, she's very precise. So she put in definitions of what um, PPE is and things like that. So uh, you can see there um, the kinds of things that towns have spent uh, money on. I think one of the other things that we've heard anecdotally, which interestingly, interestingly doesn't show up in this, but is actually reconfiguring offices to allow for them to reopen. Um, and some of that might involve some uh, minor construction. So there's that. And then the next question, do you um, anticipate any uh, decreased expenses due to spending freezes and cost savings? And this is really kind of a moving target, uh, but you see there the, um, the results of, that we got from that question. We've heard from a number of towns, we heard um, back in early May that um, they were going to not hire uh, seasonal staff, particularly for camps and summer programs. That's changed a little bit in some of the communities given new guidance from the governor and the a Agency of Commerce and Community Development. But there's a lot of towns that are looking at um, not hiring seasonal staff. And then um, administrative office uh, staff, those kinds of things. Um, we did get data on uh, what kinds of functions um, were furloughed or, or um, put on, given, sent to unemployment. Uh, and uh, administrative office had a lot of those folks were furloughed or, or um, had, to, had to collect unemployment. We anticipate that um, quite a few of them will be hired back when this is over or when it, that things turn around a little bit. But um, when you look at, at functions like wastewater treatment and public safety and emergency medical services, those, um, those functions were not uh, furloughed. I don't think in any town really that what they've gone done is gone to split shifts and things like that. Um, and then what, what kind of requests are you receiving from citizens, nonprofits and local businesses? So, and it's quite a range of, um, of requests. So that was just sort of to give you a little context in terms of what the conversation is at the um, local level right now. And the other thing I wanna mention is that there's really a, a very wide range of um, communities and, and what they're doing. If, if you look at our largest city, Burlington, um, they put together a whole resource recovery center. Um, they're, they're performing all kinds of functions that they never did before. Um, Winooski is in a similar um, boat. And then some of the very small towns that shut offices for um, a month or so really didn't have um, additional expenses other than trying to sort out how to hold meetings and how to in, um, include the public and, and working with teleconferencing platforms that they never used before. So it's a very wide range. And I, I guess I'll leave it there, Madam Chair. And, and if people have questions, I'm happy to answer them. All right, Jim Harrison. Thank you. Uh, Karen, thank you for um, forwarding along the uh, bar graphs with all the fancy colors um, and sharing what your questions were. I'm curious if you were able to get any information on actual dollars spent. Um, and maybe it's there and I'm just missing it. It looked like most of there are 
you know, 20 people, 20 towns said yes to this, but um, any sense of average dollars? There, um, so the problem is that there's not an average, you know, there's some towns that really haven't spent anything. And there's some towns that are up in the million dollar range. And, and it's partly because of size and what they've been asked to do and sort of their capacity to pivot to, um, to providing new services to local officials. So, I mean, I could, I could give you some of the responses that, that we got, but there's, there's not an average. Which, which means that I think that the way that S349 is constructed that has sort of a population component to it, um, it will, will be helpful. Um, I can appreciate that. And I think there is probably some correlation with size of a community. Um, on any of the dollars you did get, is there any way to put them into a ratio um, per town. For example, Burlington's much different than uh, my town of Chittenden, certainly, um, right. but there might be something related to size. I, and I'm just guessing here that would well, help us. Um, I, I can ask Heather, it, our, our um, survey person, if she can put that together. I, I Definitely can't. I'm not a math person. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> so, um, but but I can ask her if she could come up with an average figure. She might be able to do it this morning. Thank you. And I'm not looking to delay things. I, I, what the Senate did may be the right approach. I just we don't have any basis as to where do we draw the minimums or maximums. Um, you know, based on uh, what we know right now. Yeah, um, well, I'll, I'll see what I can get for you. Okay, thank you. Committee, any other questions for Karen? All right, excellent. Um, so uh, Bobby Brimblecombe, I'm wondering if you have some thoughts on, um, on uh, extra pressures that municipalities are uh, are experiencing during COVID and uh, if you can enlighten us at all, sort of the range of challenges that are out there. Well, I have to say in Marshfield, we haven't had any tax collection yet, so I can't speak to what the financial pressure will be. We did have some construction to do to make my office more um, easier to distance. As far as the, the community goes, we've, we've been able to maintain most of the town services, you know, dog licensing, that sort of thing through the mail. I think you'll hear, you'll hear from other people today. The biggest challenge has been the land records. People who have lost their jobs would like to refinance their mortgage, draw some of their equity there were real estate transactions that were already in the works and everything had to come to a halt when the select board closed this building. Um, we are, um, we're lucky we have some of our land records online and the fee changes that we made last year have allowed more towns to begin digitizing their land records, but Title searches require 40 years of history in, in a lot of cases. And the cost to index those back records is prohibitive for most towns. We've been pecking away at it a little bit for the last 10 years, working our way back, but it's very time consuming. And the only really effective way to do it is to hire a service to have it done for us because we don't have extra staff to dedicate. So for, for a town our size, we, we were able to continue almost everything that we normally do other than the land records. So, our, road, our road crew didn't really make any changes. We, 
we can do most of our other operations by mail. It's a little less convenient. We've had to turn away people that want notaries, but that's been addressed. Mostly just the land records that have been impacted. Mm -hmm. And um, I would assume that the the fee, because it only uh, came into effect last year, has not uh, has not given very many clerks uh, a pot of money in, from which they could start to do some of this work. Is digitizing uh, land records something that you can accomplish during this time of social distancing? Yes. So help me understand a little bit about what that looks like in your office. So land records arrive usually by mail. And before we were digitizing land records, we would photocopy them, make the land record books, type index cards, and anyone wanting to do a title search would have to come into the vault, look at the index cards, and pull open those books and everything would have to be done right here. Now with the system that we have, the land records still arrive through the mail. That's something that we could change. We could um, pass legislation to allow electronic recording, but we don't have that capability right now. But they arrive in the mail. We index them and scan them and they're immediately available online to anybody sitting at their home office they can see exactly what they would see if they were here. Did you have to buy a scanner um, just for that purpose? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I, my, my startup costs were relatively low because we already had computers. I think we may have replaced our desktops, but we already had computers. We had to buy a desktop scanner and we had to upgrade our internet service because the land records are hosted. The system that we use is on the internet. We have to have good internet. Yeah. And the, the, fee that, the fee that we're collecting, the $4 that we're setting aside for records restoration pays for my land records system, but there's nothing left over to, to do back indexing. Mm. Committee, any questions for Bobby on um, on the expenses that uh, that she's talking about, COVID related? All right, uh, John Gannon. Thank you. Um, oops, Bobby just disappeared. <laughs> Sorry, I have someone knocking on my door. Okay. <laughs> you have a question for her and she's answering the door. That's fun. Right. Oh, the challenges of meeting remotely. Um, may I make a comment while, while we're waiting for Bobby? Absolutely. Um, it, in large part, the, the issue around digitizing is really almost a commerce issue. It's that we need to have the ability for property owners to you know, get the information they need to uh, transfer property or to refinance, um, particularly now when, when interest rates are so low. Um, so I, I just wanted to put that out there that this is not just a um, municipal issue. It's, it's something that provides a vital service to um, property owners in Vermont. Thank you. All right, um, go ahead. So, no, I understand the benefit of, of digitizing records. I mean, Wilmington digitized its records after Tropical Storm Irene. And so um, lawyers were able to continue to do property searches during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, what, what system are you using, Bobby, to, to digitize your records? I'm using the COT system. Okay, so that's pretty common among Vermont towns? There are, there are four vendors that 
almost all of the towns that are digitizing, there are four vendors that they use. Three of them have online portals. The fourth is um, the Nimrix system. It's a Vermont based company and it's great for indexing and scanning. I used to use it, but it's not really, it's not as amenable to doing an online search. There's no online access. Okay. So most, most towns that have an online system have either the COT system, Avenue, or Co-File. Those are, and those are the three vendors that we survey to get pricing. And why did you choose to go to, with COT? Because they would let me do the back indexing and scanning myself, and I underestimated how long that would take. And they were the most cost effective at the time and the most flexible. I did a lot of research. I went to their, uh, the Plattsburgh recording office to see the COT system. And I went um, to Syracuse, New York to see what's now the Avenue system. And the COT system was the best fit for my office. Okay, thank you. Bob Hooper. Uh, Bobby, in that system and, and the other ones, do you still own the data and can transfer it to another vendor if you choose or does it have yeah. to be? Yes, it's still my data. Okay. And compatibility between one system and the other is sort of a universal thing? As You mean if I was to change systems to transfer? Yeah. Somebody could still do a search? Oh, yes, there are there are similarities in the search functions. I think it probably takes a couple of minutes to learn how to do a search in each of the systems. They're all similar. Thank you. Any other questions for Bobby? All right, I don't see anybody diving for their little blue hand. So. Um, I think what I'd like to do at this point is invite um, Jim Knapp and Chuck Storo to, uh, to share with us your thoughts on uh, COVID related expenses around digitizing land records. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members for taking us at such short notice. Uh, my name is Chuck Storo. I'm with Leonine Public Affairs. And I'm here on behalf of Connecticut Attorneys Title Insurance Corporation, uh, which is actually a Vermont domestic insurance company that's primarily regulated by Vermont DFR. Um, CADIC is an important player in the title insurance market in Vermont, and title insurance is an important uh, aspect of the overall real estate world in Vermont. Um, I'm actually part of a work group uh, that is a loose knit uh, group of people that includes um, the Vermont Municipal Clerks and Treasurers Association, VLCT, uh, the Bar Association, uh, the Realtors Association, and the Bankers Association. And we came together after um, speaking with Senate GovOps about the problems that were presented to by virtue of the lack of uh, uh, access to the land records. Um, we spoke to the committee about the problems that are out there right now on that. And the issue of digitizing the land records came up and we were basically instructed to uh, collaborate with each other and try and come up with a proposal. Um, we're sort of, our proceedings have been facilitated by Tanya Marshall from the Vermont Secretary of State's office. She's the state archivist. Um, and we've been, you know, looking at this issue and trying to get some some cost information and just sort of understand how we could move forward on this. And um, when we saw uh, S three forty nine, we thought um, it might provide a means or a vehicle by which we could move forward on this issue. Um, as Ms. Brimblecone explained, you know, the the COVID emergency has significantly. Uh, impaired people's ability to access the, the land records. Um, you know, originally under the governor's stay safe, stay, stay home 
order. Uh, municipal clerk's offices were com closed completely. Um, while that restriction has been lifted, um, as a practical matter, many offices are not open at all or are only open on a very limited basis uh, in terms of the duration that a person can be in there um, and the number of people uh, that can be in there to, to abide by social distancing requirements and also reflective of the fact that there have been furloughs of municipal employees that have um, left clerk's offices shorthanded and therefore not really able to serve people uh, fully who want to come in and look at the land records. This has created a big problem in terms of uh, Vermonters' abilities to move forward with real estate transaction. Uh, first of all, the, the market is actually quite strong. Uh, there's a lot of people who want to buy houses in Vermont. Um, and uh, you know, you need to do a title search in order to engage in a, a purchase and sale of property. And um, as was also mentioned, uh, a lot of folks want to take advantage of low interest rates and uh, refinance their mortgages and pull some equity out so that they can to tide them over during this emergency. And all of that has been significantly impacted by the inability to uh, have uh, good access to the land records which generally speaking requires, you know, in-person uh, physical examination of the deeds and other instruments that are recorded in the land records and the, the index for find indexes for finding those uh, records. Um, so what we've we just, uh, have come up with is, is the idea of building off of what is already out there um, to a certain extent on the part of some towns that have started digitizing their land records and making them available online. Um, Mr. Knapp, who's a part of the, uh, here on behalf of the Vermont Bar Association has done some survey work and can explain a little bit more what's going on or what is out there right now in terms of uh, online accessibility of the land records. But um, for the most part, uh, you know, first of all, um, the majority of towns are not online. Uh, and secondly, the, those that are online are only uh, you can only access records after a relatively recent date, uh, say in the last 10 years at most. Um, and therefore, you know, you really can't do the 40 to 60 year title search that um, is required. Um, basically, what you have to do is you have to go back 40 years uh, on the title to a property. And then whoever owns the prop owned the property as of 40 years ago, you go further back to when they first acquired the property. So generally speaking, you need to search back about 40 to 60 years. Um, our proposal is to basically fund um, the, uh, come up with a sum of money that would be dispersed to towns so that those towns that are not online could get online, hire a vendor uh, to get, get online on a going forward, forward basis, and then also to fund what I'm gonna call back scanning, um, scanning uh, the paper instruments that have already been filed going back 40 years uh, in order to have, you know, meaningful uh, set of land records available online. And that back scanning would also uh, be done with respect to the towns that are already online to get their records going back 40 years also online um, as it turns out, a lot of the town's land records are, are also on microfilm uh, in the state's uh, uh, records. Um, the, uh, the records division of the Secretary of State's office has uh, a large collection of microfilm land records, and it turns out that it would be, uh, you know, relatively, it would be less expensive to, to have those microfilm images converted to digital images than it would be to necessarily go into each town clerk's office and scan the actual paper documents themselves. So I throw that out there. Um, and so, you know, one of the questions is we, we, we see the, you know, the CARES Act money uh, as being a, a source of funds to uh, fund this project. Um, you know, but of course there's restrictions on the use of that money um, by the US tr uh, Treasury. And I posted uh, or submitted to the committee assistant um, 
the latest guidance that I could find from um, JFO on this issue. It, and basically, you know, the, the, the requirement is, first of all, that the, that the expense that's funded with this money be incurred uh, between now and the end of the year. Um, we think that that is possible because there are vendors out there that could do this job and agreements could be reached with them relatively quickly to uh, uh, get going on this. Um, so we think we would meet that requirement. Um, real uh, sort of, uh, I guess, issue would be, you know, is this a necessary expenditure occurred due to or result of the COVID-19 uh, health emergency. We think that uh, this, this proposal would, would uh, pass that test, um, you know, in order to digitize the land records, it's gonna cost money. Um, that's the only way to do it is to spend some money to uh, get that done. And this is, is in fact attributable to the, uh, the health emergency because as a result of the health emergency, you know, the ability to access those records in person is either non-existent or so limited that it is not um, um, meaningful um, access. So, um, you know, these standards are pretty general, um, but I do think that there's a solid argument to be made that uh, this proposal falls within those guidelines. Um, one thing I will note in looking at the document uh, that JFO uh, has put out is that they indicate that the U.S. Treasury guidance suggests use of CFR monies uh, basically turns on the state's determination uh, as to whether or not a specific expenditure is necessary. So in other words, you know, there's some deference that's being shown there if the state thinks that something is necessary. Uh, as a result of the health emergency, then um, it appears that U.S. Treasury is going to defer to that determination um, considerably. So, um, you know, overall, we do feel that uh, this proposal meets the, uh, uh, the guidance that's been uh, put out in connection with using these monies. It's sort of similar in some ways to using uh, the money to expand uh, rural broadband uh, capacity to facilitate distance learning and telework, which is an example of, um, of, a, of an expenditure that is considered uh, appropriate in connection with using these monies. Um, in a sense, it's, it's similar to telework. Uh, the ability, you know, uh, accessing land records is important to the economy, is important to Vermonters' well, well-being. And since you can't do it uh, in person, um, being able to do it electronically via the internet is um, um, similar to expanding rural broadband. So, um, you know, we submit that this is an allowable use and we realize it's a big ask um, in relation to the money you have, but uh, we'd like to, you know, at a minimum have the, we appreciate the opportunity to bring this issue to your attention and hope that we can figure out a way to uh, fund it. Um, and so that's what I have at this point and be happy to take some questions, but I, I would also invite uh, Mr. Knapp to, you know, speak to the issue in general. And also he uh, is the one who put pen to paper, paper to figure out sort of the cost uh, that we're proposing, which is, uh, or that we would like seek funding for, which is $18 million. So. With that, I'll stop and turn it over to Jim, but I'm happy to take questions in the meantime. So Bob Hooper, do you have a question for Chuck? I'll wait and uh, hear what Jim has to say, Madam Chair. Thank you. Go ahead, Jim. All right, thank you for inviting me to talk. Um, here's what we did. Um, Two weeks ago, we sent out a survey to all of the towns in the state of Vermont with the kind assistance of the Secretary of State's office and some folks from our committee. And in response, we got 167 towns who gave us some data um, on their state of their records. What we learned was that there are 33 towns that have some images online that are searchable. There are 44 towns who have some element of their land records index online, but not images that you can see. We have 128 towns that have computer indexes 
and that includes the 44 that I referenced. But the difference between the 44 and the 128, uh, don't do math in public, something like 80, um, are only visible uh, within the office. So what we then asked was, what's, if you're using a system, what system are you using? And the answer was, COTS has 20 towns, Avenue has 15 towns, Cofile, which I think is a newer entity, has eight presently, and the Nemric system has 57 towns. So in those numbers are everybody who's online. For instance, the town, I, the city I live in, South Burlington, has their land records digitized, but they're not online. So, and I think they use the COTS system or Avenue, I'm not sure which, it's been a while since I've been over there to look. So we thought a quick, easy way to get a sense of what this would cost would be to ask the towns what it costs them per page to put their, to digitize their records and put them online. And that turned out to be completely unreliable because the range of estimates was from five cents a page to $2.95 a page, which the span is a little bit big to figure out um, what, uh, what the right number was. So with that in mind, I engaged in a little bit of mathematical juggling of the data that I had. And I've concluded that on the average, each town will need to scan, index, and post about 44,000 pages. So for all 250 towns in this state, that would be 9,994,000 pages to process. Using the information that each of the companies gave us, and um, I'll start with Avenue because they were the first ones to return their survey. We estimated that the initial startup cost per town is um, somewhere between $5,700 and $6,000 just to turn the switch on. That doesn't include processing any documentation at all. If we're able to use the um, Secretary of State's, the archivist's uh, microfilm copies, we have about a million to a million one hundred thousand dollars in uh, conversion costs, where they take a microfilm image and essentially turn it into a digital image that can go up on the land records. The problem with that is, and and this is uh, uh, this is an aspect that that doesn't have a good solution right now. Those images are are, are a snapshot in time. The land records are actually a living instrument because when a discharge comes in, a town clerk like Bobby will write on the mortgage deed, discharge at, and the book and page where the discharge is. And if we only convert those digital images, they won't have all of those annotations because those digital images may be anywhere from a few months to a few years old. So we'll spend a lot of money to do that, but we'll be behind again. Not that that can't be fixed. It's just a consideration whether we follow the concept of microfilm conversion. The real challenge in the microfilm conversion is that what you have to do is run a specific process on each image to enhance, the, enhance that image because microfilm is not a very high resolution process. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll run an image, they'll run a process on the image to make it a little bit better so it will show up online better. The combination of conversion and enhancement, as I said, is about uh, a million one across all the towns. The real challenge comes in taking those digital images and indexing them using Avenue's estimate that you have to index essentially out of the total 2.5 pages turns into a document. So that would mean a two page warranty deed is two pages, an 18 page mortgage is 18 pages, a one page discharge is one page and Avenue through their process has, assumed, has determined that if you're budgeting, you should guess 2.5 pages uh, turns into one index entry. 
at that rate, the 10 million pages or 9.9 .9 million pages that we're looking at would cost about $10 million to index. Taking all of that um, to run back to 1980, which is probably mostly long enough in most towns to probably cover the bulk of title examination requirements with a, a contingency built in for administrative costs, uh, my poor math skills, and anything else, we're talking between 16 million and $21 million total to um, digitize the records in all the towns in Vermont back to 1980. Um, I ran the same kind of numbers on COTS because we got their um, uh, section their proposal a little bit later. Cofile only came in recently and I haven't had time to do a similar analysis of theirs. The COTS system has a much more expensive startup process. Their, their take on the startup process, including the first year of support is close to $20,000 per town. Their microfilm conversion is more expensive. Their paper to digital scanning system is um, more expensive, but their indexing cost is less. So overall, their numbers came out at almost exactly the same, about $16 million to $25 million. I'm guessing that the high end estimates that I came up with, the 21 million, the 25 million are probably too high. My guess is the 16 million estimate is probably a little too low and that's how we settled on the 18 million. So those are the approximate numbers that we have. I'm happy to try and answer questions that anyone has um, or explain more fully how I arrived at some of these numbers if that's of interest. Thank you. We've got some little blue hands lighting up. Uh, Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for either of the individuals testifying, in a given year, and then comparatively speaking in a COVID year, how many people will the digitizing of these records serve? Oh, how many mortgages do we transact? What percentage of the population? I mean, it was brought up that, you know, this is comparable to learning from home with broadband or expanding something like that. And I'm just sort of looking for a relative idea of how many people this reaches as opposed to something else. That's a really good question. And I don't have the answer to that. I, I, I have no idea how many individual documents are recorded. Um, I can tell you that I've had conversations with three different law firms in the last 24 hours each of whom had uh, between six and 10 closings scheduled on either Thursday or Friday of this week. But that's purely anecdotal and fairly difficult to convert to real numbers. Um, that's certainly a number we could do some investigation on, but I don't have data to indicate right now what that is. So it's a simple question of how many title searches get done in an average year. Okay. Well, we can certainly begin looking into that. Thank you. I, I, I can tell you that years ago when I was in private practice, I averaged, I averaged between 200 and 250 a year, but I only did uh, higher end commercial transactions. So I had no residential practice at all. Um, and that's where the bulk of this is. I would say on the, just a quick guess, one of my agents uh, issue uh, does between 20 and 25, this is one person in the state, does 20 to 25 closings a week. All right, uh, Jim Harrison. Great, thanks uh, Jim and Chuck for uh, bringing the issue forward and also Jim for some of the numbers. Um, I don't know that there's anyone on the committee that would um, take any issue with uh, in an ideal world trying to get all of this digital and online accessible. But I do wonder um, because every dollar 
we potentially allocate here means uh, a dollar that doesn't get spent somewhere else, um, i.e. my broadband coverage that Representative Hooper uh, so nicely articulated the other day, um, which is why my video feed is off. So one of my towns um, at the start of this, when they started doing office hours um, by appointment only or trying to do it via mail, um, went ahead and published their index uh, online so that the title attorneys could say, look, I need page such and such of journal such and such um, and give them a list so they could go and do the research for them. Um, how many towns have their indexes published online and might that not be a easier ask to get everybody with an index online so we know where to look if we can't easily have title attorneys going into town halls? Based on the survey results, uh, 44 towns have their indexes online, uh, 33 have their images online, which would include their index. So I would say if you combine those numbers, it would be 77 towns have some or all of their index and records online. So would now, it be re reasonable to just put everyone to start with? I'm not saying what, what you're suggesting for the whole ball of wax sounds great, um, but if we just did the indexes, that might be doable, I'm thinking, in a shorter time span and for, for a lot less money. Is that fair or not? The, uh, uh, I don't know about time span. Um, the process of indexing is, is data intensive. Uh, it, it involves essentially looking at every page, identifying the parties involved, entering the parties into a database system. I can tell you that based on uh, the two companies that I looked at, the, they would indicate the cost to index alone. This does not include conversion, scanning, or anything else is $10 million. So Bobby Bryn McComb is also waving her hand. I think she wants to weigh in on this. Great. I was I was going to say basically what Jim said, getting the image done is very simple. They come on site with a scanner, they run everything through the scanner. That's easy, it's inexpensive, relatively inexpensive. The indexing is the most time consuming and the most expensive part of the project. And the yeah, challenge with having just the indexes online are the clerk now spends a fair amount of time identifying, scanning, and emailing documents. The, the process of title searching is a very iterative process. I may look at one document that leads me to need to look at six documents that needs me to look at each of those six documents turns into another three or four documents. In a clerk's office with multiple employees, probably going to be a bigger town, probably with a higher percentage of transactions going on, I could see a circumstance where in a busy day, you might have six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 attorneys asking the clerk to please send 20 pages, 30 minutes later, another 20 pages, 25 minutes later, three more pages, 15 minutes later, 20 pages. A single clerk in a single office could never keep up with that volume. They would have no time to do anything else that they're required to do. It's an interesting stopgap process. The people that I've talked to who've done title searches that way it's very interesting. They range from people who are satisfied that it works to people who have refused to do real estate unless they can look at the records because they believe it's their obligation to their client to go examine the records on their own. And so it's a solution. It would probably save some money, but um, 
the other question is, how is the town going to put their searchable index up, up online without engaging one of these companies who hosts the searchable index? An index that's nothing but a PDF of thousands of pages, unfortunately, isn't going to solve the problem because there's no way to search that particular index. Those would be my thoughts on the um, just indexing, but certainly indexing is better than nothing. Okay, no, I, I appreciate that, Jim. I, I'm just, I'm looking at $18 million that we may not have. Well, um, I understand, yeah. So, um, you know, how can we potentially narrow it? Another possible path to go would be, and it wouldn't get 100%, um, but could be a uh, matching grant type program. In other words, if my town is not online, um, maybe this pot of money is available for 50% grant. And I'm just picking a number here. I don't mm -hmm. know what, what it is. Um, it might push some towns to take advantage of it this one-time opportunity, uh, but it certainly wouldn't take every town. It wouldn't, um, every town wouldn't. So you, so you might go from 70 towns to 120 towns. I don't know, I'm just picking a number, um, but it would help. Yes, and, and the other option would be, um, maybe not every town wants to go online. Maybe not every town wants to digitize. I can imagine that there are some small towns where the ongoing annual cost of somewhere between three and $6,000 a year, maybe more than the town can pay or is willing to pay. And if that's the case, maybe the answer is you let the towns apply for a grant to get their records online and the towns that don't want to apply, don't apply. And there's a certain amount of money and I do think getting the towns that have the population centers online where there's a higher percentage of real estate transactions, I don't want to pick on anyone in particular, but I grew up in the Northeast Kingdom. So there are a number of towns up there that probably do not have a high volume of land record transactions. And they're also probably the towns that are closed or have minimal staff and can't really let people in to do searches. And uh, it's, it's challenging for me to say we should not support every citizen in the state of Vermont. But if there were towns that had four, five, 6,000 residents who weren't online, if we could focus on getting them online because they are gonna have the bulk of the real estate transactions, that might be another way to have a smaller ass, but get a big, bigger bang for every dollar. Um, okay, thank you. Bobby, go ahead. I just, I wanted to add to what I said earlier about the indexing. If we hire one of these um, outside vendors to do the indexing, they do it from the images. We don't give, we don't send our actual books out of state. So the indexing comes first. It's I, or comes after the imaging. There's no way to do just the indexing. Does that make sense? Because we wouldn't want to send our actual books to Ohio or wherever they are. They would come on site, film everything, and then take the film back to their office to do the indexing. That does make sense. Thank you. John Gannon. Um, thank you. Sort of following up on, on Jim's questions about how to whittle down this $18 million ask or, or $16 million ask. Um, have you, do we have data on how much restoration funds are available town by town? Because I know some towns were collecting before we changed the fees. Uh, the towns are in the process of beginning to gather that data, but I believe we've only had about a year of collections. So the data may not be very um, extensive. Um, but I, I, Carol Dawes, who is the clerk in Barry City, 
uh, is leading the, the group that's collecting that data because they owe you folks a report in a couple of years. And I know Carol mentioned on one of our calls that she's starting the process of collecting the data. I don't know how much is available. And, and, and my and guess do is- Do we have any data? Do we have any data on which towns have a high number of transactions? No, but I can tell you not at this moment, but with a little bit of work, I can tell you which towns have the most pages that would need to be processed. Well, but I'm looking at an, another way is, uh, I mean, as you said, some, some towns don't see many real estate transactions in any given year where others see a lot. Um, and so prioritizing towns that do see a lot of real estate transactions might make some sense, um, especially in a grant process. Again, we can certainly supplement our survey and get that data, but I don't have that data. That wasn't, that wasn't the way we asked the question. Okay. So, so Karen, I see that you've unmuted yourself. Did you want to chip in on something here? Well, it, it seems that maybe an approach to take might be to um, set up a grant program that asks for the number of um, transactions that there are, and then you could uh, you could um, rank the the towns that get those grants based on the number of transactions. You wouldn't actually need to have the information today, but you could make it part of the grant requirement. And, okay, thank you. And I had one more question, and this is with respect to the microfilm that's at Vasara. So I'm a little confused as how that information will be useful, um, given um, Jim's comment that those are like static documents that may not be updated by a town clerk. Um, so I'm just trying to understand how using those documents it would benefit this process? Um, conversion is slightly less expensive than raw scanning, not significantly, but slightly less. And if we were trying to fit a project into a budget, having that data is better than not having any data and probably not as good as live scanning um, over time. It, yeah, I'm it, just, it's, it might save money in the short term, but in the long term, you're going to have records that are inaccurate. Yes. So I, yes, I don't yes. see, I don't see the savings. I, I mean, ultimately, I, I mean, if, I mean, if we're going to do this, we want to have a, a product that is reliable. And so I, I don't understand how converting those documents, which may not contain things like, you know, if a mortgage was discharged, um, is all that helpful. It may not be. When we were trying to, when we were trying to grasp the scope of how, what this was, uh, the folks at Vicera uh, offered that they had the microfilm and the companies that do this offered conversion and so it was uh, something of a relatively easy um, computation just to add that in. I, I don't know that conversion is better, certainly from the point of view of someone who used to do title searches but doesn't any longer. Um, having the best live up-to-date documents is a better investment than something that could be anywhere from months to years old. I agree. And would Visara put a charge on accessing their microfilm? It's actually our microfilm that they are storing for us. Oh, it's your mic. Okay. So hopefully not. No, it, I, my recollection is it was fifteen dollars a fill. Uh, for for the Secretary of State's office. The Secretary of State's office offered a conversion process themselves. What I don't know is whether that conversion process 
would work for these vendors? That was a question way beyond the scope of anything we could ask in a survey that we could ask people to respond to in three days. Okay. So it's possible that the Secretary of State's office can do the conversion for significantly less than the uh, million plus dollars that we have on either of the two proposals. But I don't know how each conversion process works and whether it would create images useful for a vendor. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so uh, we have about 25 minutes left of committee this morning and I do have one other um, potential uh, need for funding to get on the table. Uh, so Bob Hooper, go ahead with your question and then we may shift gears. My, my quick question. Um, the subject of towns having some lot, some few transactions brought up this question. Uh, do timeshares enjoy the traditional uh, title search when they do a transfer? Jim immediately looks up in the air. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, looks over his shoulder, him. hoping that there's someone's whispering in his ear the answer to the question. Um, the few timeshare projects that I, the few timeshare transfers that I was involved in split about 50-50. Half the time the people said they didn't want to pay the cost of having the title search done, they would take the risk and about 50% of the time they wanted the title search done to verify that the person who was selling it to them was the actual legal owner of the property. I would suspect that Maybe the answer is yes and no, that that some people want the search, some people don't. And if a bank is involved, it's invariably going to be a requirement to do the search. Absolutely. As, as a function of insurance, title as insurance? As a function of just uh, security of their collateral. You know. okay. Thank you. The bank is required by statute to have a title search for any property that they loan money secured by a mortgage on. All right, so um, I'm going to ask folks to continue to work on ways of narrowing this, um, this project to be more directly COVID related and, uh, and also so that um, we can uh, make an honest good faith effort to, if we decide to put money to supporting this, uh, that we're actually going to have uh, a few dollars within our uh, CRF bucket to put into this project. So please, uh, please keep thinking of, of ways we can put bumpers around us that will make it work. Um, so it had, it came to my attention that the um, uh, COVID related expenses of uh, solid waste districts weren't necessarily um, it, uh, allowable in the Senate version of this bill as a allowable um, reimbursement. And so I'm, I have Paul Tomasi here with the Northeast Kingdom Solid Waste Management District um, to help us understand a little bit of the COVID challenges um, of these essential businesses and whether there's other COVID related um, uh, funding sources to support them. So uh, Paul, go ahead. Yeah, thanks uh, for allowing me to testify on such short notice. Um, we've been kind of scrambling ever since the pandemic um, occurred to, you know, trying to identify sources of funding. Um, kept our eye, you know, mainly on the federal level, uh, but also on the state level. And um, to date, um, literally all forms of relief have passed over uh, municipalities uh, until recently. And then, you know, we, we heard about uh, S349 being put forward um, and then wondered why, you know, solid waste districts were, um, were excluded. Uh, we were deemed an essential function as part of uh, the governor's um, executive order. Um, here at the Northeast Kingdom Waste Management District, we were um, essentially forced to um, reconfigure our staffing so that we could maintain social distancing yet continue to provide services. 
So we have a relatively small staff of about 11 individuals, but um, we took steps to split them in groups so as not to have uh, more than two people uh, in the same space at the same time. Uh, we did that in March, late March, and we continued that until um, late May. Um, so essentially what we did, we, we offered our um, employees um, what we're calling hazard pay for, um, we, we paid them for 40 hours, but they were only required to come in for 24. And then towards the end of that period, uh, they came in instead of three days a week, four days a week to kind of ease them back into the, the routine of things. So most of our COVID related costs are behind us. Of course, you know, that assumes no kind of flare up and reestablishment of a stay at home order. Um, I did try and send Andrea a spreadsheet that details all of our costs during that time period. Um, I will, I don't know if uh, the committee members have actually seen that yet, um, but most of our costs are related with the, the hazard pay and that totals around $19,000 and then about another $1,000 in direct costs for things like Zoom, um, masks, disinfectant wipes, uh, a thermometer so that we can check uh, employees' temperatures, uh, supplies, you know, specifically related hand sanitizers and things like that. I will tell you that not all solid waste districts are created equal. So I, I would be hesitant to say that our costs are representative of other waste districts. Uh, we do have a district manager's meeting scheduled for this Thursday, and we're hoping to um, uh, share all of our costs um, at that time. So I don't have, you know, I know Jim asked the question uh, earlier to Karen about average costs for, for towns. Um, I don't have that. All I have is what we've spent. Um, but I, I feel confident that the other solid waste districts could provide um, more detailed figures. Um, I don't know, though, however, if all of the solid waste districts have gone back um, to full staffing. I, I think some of my colleagues are still working uh, from home. Um, we were never really able to do that because of the, the poor internet service here in the Northeast Cape. Thank you. Any questions from committee members? Uh, Marsha Gardner. Uh, this may not be a question for Paul, but other committee members, do we know if the hazard pay bill would uh, cover the expenses that, that Paul has outlined to us? I'm not sure of the scope of that bill, but Stephanie Barrett has turned on her video, so I'm guessing that. <laughs> um, so uh, as it came over from the Senate, uh, uh, government employees were explicitly included. The hazard waste districts, I don't know if they would fall, fall on that. Definitely the waste haulers would have been covered by the Senate version of the hazard pay bill. I know on the House side, the hazard pay bill is probably going to be significantly revised if it goes at all, um, is what I've heard. So I don't um, I don't know what the status of the, that is at the moment, but I, um, if, if solid waste districts are considered a sort of a governmental entity, I don't think they would be included, um, the districts themselves in the hazard, in the hazard pay bill. Um, but the hazard pay that they are experiencing would be part of what would be covered as an allowable expense under S349 here. It's just how, uh, the solid waste districts get uh, represented in either item one or two, um, either added explicitly in number two, along with the sheriffs and counties and, and gores, or do the solid waste districts, do they have an ability to, to bill their the towns that they serve in any way for their costs? And then that would be reflected in number one by the towns if they submit. So that's the question I think on that one. Thanks so much, Stephanie. I appreciate it. Sure. 
Jim Harrison. Paul, it's good to see you again. It's been a while. Um, thank you for sending the spreadsheet. Um, can I assume from this the 20000 is the extra cost that you've incurred related to COVID for your district? Yes, that's correct. And if I may, um, you know, I know um, I reached out to Senator Kitchell when this bill was moving through the Senate, and she mentioned the possibility of um, having us go to the towns for reimbursement. I will tell you, you know, we have 49 member towns, and unless there's some sort of direct assistance to, you know, help with that, I, I think that's going to be a real struggle to try and walk all of our members through that process. In how many solid waste districts are there again? Uh, I want to say 11. I, I'm embarrassed to not know the exact figure, but it's probably fair to say you have the most towns in your district, though. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Other questions from committee members? Welcome back, Rob. Um, we are uh, we are rapidly nearing the end of our committee time this morning, and so um, thank you, Paul, for for helping us understand the COVID-related expenses that your uh, your district has incurred. And um, I I only wish that your director's meeting was tomorrow instead of Thursday because. Um, the the timeline on making a recommendation on this bill not, might not allow us to wait until then. Uh, so we are going to need to look at how we would craft um, the eligible expenses or the the amount of money that we might put towards um, towards solid waste management district uh, COVID expenses. Um, so I would. I, Put out the same invitation to you that I did to the folks talking about um, digitizing um, land records, and and that is to, you know, keep doing some work on this, keep thinking about how uh, how to um, craft a, a grant program or on what basis um, money might be made available to these districts. Um, committee, any other questions on anything that we've heard so far today? I'm actually checking on it today. Are you? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I, um, I think that we should all take um, a moment to stretch before we get on the house Zoom at 10 o'clock. And so we will need to come back to this at our next committee meeting. Um, and so would invite the folks who are here with us today to, um, to either make a proposal and get that sent out to us um, before tomorrow's committee meeting or come and join us again tomorrow. You can let Andrea, our committee assistant, know that you'd like to have the Zoom invitation. And um, for committee members, I really want to invite you to, um, you know, to, to continue to think about how we take a, um, a Senate proposal and tailor it to be the size and scope of what we're seeing the need is um, here on the House side. So uh, 1130 tomorrow for committee, although floor starts at 10. So I wonder if we might not end up getting pushed back a little bit um, for our start time tomorrow. Uh, Marsha. Madam Chair, will we have time for committee discussion on these items that we have heard today? I think that's a great idea. And and you know we could take we could take five minutes of committee discussion right now and, and still have five minutes to stretch before floor time. So um, what are what are people's thoughts on what you're hearing for need out there. Marsha, do you wanna go first? I will, thank you. Thank you. Just looking through uh, what the Vermont League sent to us, uh, and maybe I'm missing it. I, I, I just don't see anything here that pertains to um, 
digitizing land records. And while I realize that that is very important to some, you know, we're working with CARES Act money. And I think the per public perception of how we spend that money can be very important. Um, you know, I can certainly see the solid waste districts receiving some assistance. I think anyone can understand that they have had some difficulties over the past few months. Uh, I'm not so sure about um, digitizing records. So just a thought, thank you. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Uh, it's so far uh, difficult for me to conceptualize how we would make um, money available for digitizing in a way that was responsive to the immediate COVID emergency. Uh, Jim Harrison. Do we, uh, this is more of a question for you, Sarah, but do we have a total uh, number parameter that we should be working in or is it what the Senate sent over, which was the, I don't know, 15 million? No, our, um, our box to work within is 10 million. And um, furthermore, the speaker reminded me that there are several other uh, critical need areas that, uh, that, that would take any extra dollars that we didn't spend. So, um, so 10 is the max that we have to work with on this. So given that, I mean, we might consider, you know, a small portion um, for the solid waste districts. And I say small, um, you know, it could be a, a quarter million, it could be a quarter million up to a half million. I, I don't know. Um, uh, I think Paul's numbers are very helpful, um, but, you know, Chittenden might be you know, significantly more, but it would be nice if they could maybe email the districts uh, and get some information by tomorrow, uh, even if it's back of the envelope type information that might help us um, put different pots. Uh, ten, but 10 million is not a lot. Um, so um, especially when you divide it up to 250 localities. Uh, so, um, I kind of agree with Marsha. I think the digital of records would be a great uh, service. Um, I just don't know how we take 10 million and spread it to everybody um, based on what we're talking about. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. So yeah, Paul, if you have the ability to, to um, pull some other districts and, and get us some more information, that would be very helpful. Yeah, I've, I've made the note and I'm hoping um, to beat the bushes and get you some information um, before tomorrow's testimony. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Bob Hooper. Uh, I'll join in with uh, Marsha and Jim. I think John's, uh, our, the answer that John got to the moment in time question is the thing that dictates every click of the clock makes that, uh, one shot deal less and less reliable and they wouldn't use it. So without funding the whole thing, it almost seems like it's good money going the wrong way for the land records. And it, to me, it serves so many fewer people that we should be looking for the most bang for the buck. Thanks. Mike Rewicki. Um, thank you. I. Um... I agree. I'd be skeptical to, to think that's that's where money could go. I, uh, I've been put a query out to the three towns I represent, and and for example, the town of Dummerston got back to me and said they've spent about a thousand dollars to to make some accommodations in the in their small town hall office, and and I would hope small towns like that, small expenses could find some some relief out of the, these are definitively COVID related expenses. And I know Westminster has been doing some other things. And right now they're, they're not allowing people in their town because they need to do in the town hall because they need to do more. So I would hope that um, 
but small towns are experiencing across the state could could find some um, relief in, in in this funding as well. Thank you, John Gannon. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, there is another solution for the land records issue, which is the restoration fund. Um, that each town has. Um, well, that money may not be large right now. Uh, it will grow over time. One thing we may want to look at, which we didn't do in the clerk fee bill, is is mandate um, that that towns use those funds to start digitizing their records. Um, and we may want to look at that next year. But um, I, I agree with the other members of our committee that um, that's probably not the best use of the money. Um, it, giving money to towns, I, I do still have a concern um, with respect to giving, you know, money to towns and other municipalities um, in that some towns, such as Burlington, um, may have spent a lot of money on COVID-19 expenses, and I would not want to see small towns um, who may not have the capacity to quickly apply for a grant um, left out. Um, you know, and that is a big concern of mine is that this money will go to a couple of, of the larger population towns and that small towns um, will struggle. And I also think it's important to support our municipalities right now. Well, some of them are in good financial shape um, for this fiscal year. It ends on June 30th. Um, next fiscal year is a whole other story for most of them. Thank you. Excellent. Um, Hal Colston. Uh, real quickly, I just agree with, uh, whoops, here we go. I agree with Representative Hooper. Um, I think it was well said. So that's how I feel. Thank you. All right. I want to thank you all for being with us this morning. Um, Mike, your hand is still up, but I'm thinking that's maybe from before. Um, Let's all do a couple jumping jacks and grab a glass of water and see you all on the floor Zoom. Thank you for being with us today.